Is the Toyota RAV4 Hybrid truly the best midsize SUV in the world? Well, it's certainly the most popular, but this popularity has been a blessing and a curse with insane customer delivery times. Worth the wait? Let me know what you think in the comments below. And while you're at it, don't forget to subscribe to the Car Sales channel. Onwards. The Toyota RAV4 first emerged in the mid-1990s with a frumpy design true to the era. It's evolved over the decades into a more angular, rugged SUV that was the second best-selling vehicle globally in 2023. Anyway, the car is now in such high demand, it's delaying customer deliveries by more than a year in some cases. And if you don't want to wait that long, there are plenty of solid alternatives, such as the Mitsubishi Outlander, Kia Sportage, and Subaru Forester. The range starts at just under $40,000, which sounds like good value, but I've previously driven the entry-level version of the RAV4, and it is nothing short of disappointing. So, I'm hoping this model we're testing today, the Edge Hybrid, is worth the $60,000 once on-road costs are added. Toyota offers a customary five-year warranty that extends to seven years for the engine and drive line, and only costs about $260 per year to service. That said, roadside assistance costs $99 per annum, which for most manufacturers is included free. But when you consider the vehicle has better retained value than any other SUV in its class, the cost of ownership is a no-brainer. It packs a 2.5-litre petrol engine backed up by two electric motors, one at the front, one at the back, which draw power from a small one kilowatt hour nickel metal hydride battery. It's pretty low-tech stuff as far as hybrid systems are concerned, but it's tried, tested, and effective, if nothing else. The petrol engine can run solo, where it either just drives the wheels or also charges the battery a little bit because this is a plugless hybrid, and the petrol engine can run in tandem with the twin e-motors. It can also run in pure EV mode using those electric motors, but only for short periods and only at low speeds as well. However, it should theoretically reduce fuel consumption significantly. Power is transferred to all four wheels through a CVT. It's been a long time since I sat in a Toyota RAV4. Supply and demand, eh? Pretty hard to get one. But this is much nicer than I remember. It all looks and feels pretty good. And there's an oddly soothing tactility to some of the elements as well. It's nice. The Softex synthetic leather upholstery on the seats has a remarkably premium feel. And the heating and cooling vents in the cushions are the icing on these furniture-shaped cakes. The driver's seat is eight-way power adjustable with two-way lumbar adjust, but the co-pilot seat is manually adjustable, which is a bit average. I love that there's a physical volume dial, but the JBL stereo isn't amazing, and it must be said the material quality in the RAV4 is mixed. The lovely seats and dashboard materials juxtaposed with some very tacky plastics on the doors and central areas. Okay, storage features next, and the RAV4 is good but not great. I like these deep spring-loaded cup holders. They're really good, but the door pockets, they look a bit small. Do they pass the mega gulp test? Oh, you can sort of wedge it in there, but it's gonna pop out, so no. No, they do not. Um, you've got a wireless charge pad, which is pretty good here. Wireless phone charge pad, plus it's big enough for extra odds and sods in there. You've got a 12-volt socket, plenty of USB ports. You've got USB-A there and twin USB-C ports here in a medium-sized central bin. But I kind of feel like maybe a secret drawer under the chair or an extra storage space here would have helped things along a little bit. There's a sunglasses holder, a tiny glove box, and a pair of useful shelves with not-so-useful slippery inserts. The 10.5 inch central touchscreen looks good. It's got sharp visuals, quick touch response, and the sat nav doesn't look too dated either. It's actually pretty good for a Toyota product. But the operating system and menu layout is a bit clumsy. And even after a week in the car, I'm still finding myself trying to remember where certain menus are and how to find certain elements of the operating system. And there's no home screen either, which is a bit annoying. 
That said, you do get Toyota Connected Services, which works through an official app, allowing remote vehicle supervision, including stolen vehicle tracking, along with emergency assistance and over-the-air updates. But once the first year is done, you have to pay $20 per month for those mobile phone connected services, which is quite a lot per year. And in my book, it's just not worth the money. Hyundai's rival system, Blue Link, has more functionality and is free for five years, not one. Wireless Apple CarPlay is part of the package, while Android Auto is wired only. And it comes with loads of tech, but the lack of a head-up display is disappointing. The 12.3 inch digital instrument display looks lovely. And while it doesn't have quite as much visual customization as some of its rivals, there is plenty of driving info available and that's a good thing. The reversing camera is rather good with very detailed imagery streamed from the camera and an overhead 360 degree view with an excellent transparent feature that makes parking a doddle. All RAV4 models have a five star ANCAP safety rating from 2019, but it misses out on a central front head airbag that more modern rivals offer. Back seat comfort is great, amenity not so good, but let's start with comfort. You get the same pleather as the front seats or plastic leather and the same cushions, really comfortable. And also these seats are contoured, so you sort of sit in them, not perch on top of them like some seats. Um, Legroom is pretty good, I can get my feet under the seats. That's nice, plenty of headroom as well. But there are a few things that irk me, starting with the doors, they don't open as wide as some rivals. The X-Trail, for instance, that opens up to 90 degrees, which makes loading little kids in and out of the car especially a lot easier. Also, I shouldn't be able to do this in a Toyota. And then there's amenity, that's not great. Sure, you get air vents and USB-C ports, the usual fold-out armrests with cup holders and bottle holders in the doors, but there's no reading lights. And some top-spec rivals, like the Outlander, have sunshades as well in the windows. The power operated tailgate is quite vocal. It beeps a lot. Safety first, but I really like this load space. Not only is it quite low, there's no lip here, which makes loading and unloading cargo nice and easy. Amenity is pretty good with four tie down hooks, a little netted storage area and a good cargo cover that slots into this area under here but it's a shame there's no bag hooks and you get a space saver spare tire instead of a full sized spare. That said, versatility is improved with the easy fold down rear seats. While base grade RAV4s are pretty crummy, this top spec model is lovely inside, but can it maintain this momentum in a dynamic sense? Cue the driving music. Driven sedately, the Toyota RAV4 is just marvelous. It's definitely in its element in the suburbs and exurbs. It's quiet, it's comfortable, and it's effortlessly efficient. But pin the throttle to the fluffy carpet mats and that petrol engine generates plenty of noise. That said, in sport mode, the RAV4 feels every bit like it's got three power plants. The petrol and electric motors conspiring to deliver purposeful acceleration. The hybrid stuff, it's pretty good. The transition between petrol and electric modes is ultra smooth, and it's not too hard to get the most out of it with a bit of familiarization. I really like the fact there's also an EV button, but as is the case now, and quite a lot of the time it says, EV mode unavailable, hybrid battery too low. And I guess that's one of the drawbacks of having a plugless hybrid. The battery has to constantly charge and you can't just say, plug it in and charge it up. Previous gen RAV4s were typically dreary and floppy in terms of handling dynamics, but this fifth gen RAV is a different creature altogether. It actually tracks through corners with reasonable resolve and although it's not quite as tidy as a Volkswagen Tiguan or one of those Aussie tuned Kia Sportages, for a Toyota, it's none too shabby. However, when it comes to ride comfort, the RAV4 is at the top of its game. The independent suspension array doing a great job settling the car after dips and speed bumps. 
The 19-inch tyres managed to balance ride quality and grip very nicely, and combined with its direct steering and a fairly tight turning circle, it's an impressive urban chariot. Apart from the acoustically abrasive engine flare when you nail the throttle, this top-spec Toyota RAV4 has pretty good refinement levels. There's not a lot of wind noise around the mirrors or windscreen at freeway speeds, and tyre noise is fairly low as well. When it comes to fuel consumption, we weren't too far off Toyota's claim and ended up getting about 860 kilometres from one tank of fuel. That's pretty impressive considering it's only a 55 litre bladder. Visibility for the most part is pretty good in the RAV4. The upright windows give you good sight lines, but that rear pillar is quite thick, so there's a bit of a blind spot there. And the fact that it's only got 195 millimeters of ground clearance means it doesn't quite have that commanding position that you get in a Subaru Forester, which has 220 millimeters of ground clearance. Driving the RAV4 around for a week has been a pleasant event for the most part. Sure, the driving experience is a bit boring in some ways, but it goes about its business in a diligent, somewhat sustainable way, and I like that. The warm embrace of a Toyota new car has tremendous appeal. Not only do you get what should be a highly reliable vehicle, but resale values are unmatched in this class. The bonus here is that the car is actually rather nicely finished and engineered. Better yet, it's even got a bit of personality, something previous RAV4s were sorely lacking. And to answer my original question, yes, this SUV is most definitely worth the wait. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe and also leave a comment below. What would you do if you were in this situation? Would you wait a year or two for a RAV4 or would you go for one of its Korean rivals that you could get in a few months?